Hey, all right. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So good to see all your smiling faces out there today. I got to tell you, uh, man, it has been so fun and so cool uh, being at our uh, our new building and and just um, seeing how the teams come together and and do things. I've learned a lot on how to do things, and I've learned on how not to do things as well. Uh, when I'm out there, uh, there is a huge, huge hole in one of our pillars um, that I may or may not have put in when I ran into it with our lift that's out there. Um, but, hey, that's the only, only casualty is the pillar, so that's a good thing. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of cool to watch everything come together. And if, How many of you guys work with your hands or have worked with your hands in your life building things? Yeah, quite a few. It's something cool about building something and watching it come to completion, isn't it? And there's this sense of pride that, like, wow, I had something to do with that, right? And uh, as I was doing some things out, you know, you paint that final wall and the painting job is done, or, or you know, we ha- hung some sound panels up, and, and when the fa- last one goes up, it's some, some you know, just there's a lot of accomplishment and different things and, and building, and, 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 I, and I was doing this, I'm like, wow, you know, this is really cool. People who work with their hands, it's really awesome because they get to have this thing that they, like, if you're there, you're like, man, I, I built that, and, and. Every time you go in the building, you're like, yeah, I, I had something to do with that, right? And so a guy kind of showed me, you know, it's a kind of the, the same thing for me when, when I finish and put the final touches on a, on a message that I create, right? Yeah. It's, it's kind of cool. You put it together and the points come together and everything, and, and I pray, and sometimes I mix things around. A lot of times I mix things around throughout the week. I change stuff around a lot of bit, a lot of times, and it's just like this, this final thing comes together, and I'm like, you know, it's kind of similar, only different, Right? Anyway, so I thought that was kind of cool that God gave me that this week. Uh, I don't know why I shared that. Just thought I'd share that with you. Um, If you guys are able and willing um, throughout the next couple weeks to come out and support and come out and help, um, every little bit counts. If you can come and paint for a couple hours. We had a lady come out and paint for about three hours. She came out and she has a window and she came out and painted for a while and then went back and and finished up her day and and things like that. Every little bit helps um, in that. And also, uh, we mentioned the chair, buy a chair for, for yourself and then buy a chair for a future guest. So if you're you know, if you're a family of eight, obviously you're not buying 16 chairs. It's for just the adults, you and your spouse or you or, or whatever. And then for a future guest, that is totally um, an offering that's given up and above. And so if you can afford to do that, great. If you can't, please don't feel obligated in any way. Um, that's certainly not what our goal is. If you're a guest with us tonight, welcome. Um, glad you're here. But don't feel uh, obligated to, to give in any way to any of that. Um, so... I'm going to introduce this person that you all know very well, but I, I had to come up and introduce him because uh, for a couple reasons. Um, number one, I am so proud of this man. And just watching him grow, and, and our friendship has grown over the last three years. He has been a founding member and a founding elder of this church, and uh, he is uh, Mr. Everything. He's like Joey Cora. I mean, he... It, He'll do whatever you need. He's there, and he, he fills the gaps, and he, he's always willing to help. Um, but what I've seen, the growth I've seen, and we were talking on a, we had a road trip. He and I went on, and we were talking the whole time, and he did most of the talking. You guys know me. I don't talk that much. but And, um, and he shared with me, uh, this was about two months ago, and he shared with me his journey in this area of his life where God has transformed him. And kind of like we're talking about fixing things and, and putting things together, another analogy is God kind of does, this just came to me, God does that with us. Imagine how God feels when we're able to overcome something in our lives and God builds something in us. That's pretty cool, huh? Top of my head. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, anyway, he, he was sharing with me his story and, and how he, he came to, to um overcome this area of, you've already seen it, of manipulation. He was just a a manipulator. He used his words and his actions and his behaviors very, um, well, I want to say well. He could use them to to get things that he wanted in his, in his life and from people and different things. But um, anyway, so we were talking, and I said, you know, 
in a couple months, we have a series coming up called Words, and one of the things that we're going to be talking about, I was going to be talking about, is manipulation, but would you be willing to come up and share with us what God has shown you? And he said, well, sure. And um, so I want you guys to give it up for my friend, my brother, a man I'm super proud of, proud to call friend, Elder, Elder Pat Calden. <laughs> You know, what? Okay. <laughs> Got to worry about the clock with me. I kind of felt like I was uh, walking up on stage at, uh, I don't know, a, a nighttime talk show with guys yelling or stuff. That was, that was kind of good. We all know that we are, um, we're, uh, can we get that ring out of there a little bit? Uh, sorry. But we're talking... We're talking about words in our series um, in the last few weeks and, and why we use our words, what our words do to others. And manipulation is really kind of a convoluted thing. So we're going to talk about, the day, about that today, what it is, how we do it, and who we do it to. As you can see, the art of manipulation or what? How you want. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's put up uh, Psalms 19.14 for us, please. Uh, this is the verse that we're using uh, for this whole series. It says, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. So that's what we're kind of basing all of these things on. But we've we got a lot to cover tonight, so we're going to go straight into the word, which is really the best way to do things anyway, right? Let's go to James. So we have a James 3. James is after all the... It's actually towards Hebrews, which is two-thirds of the way through the New Testament. Keep flipping. It says here, among all the parts in the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. What it also says in there is that it sets our lives on fire. And it is a danger to our soul. So... I was thinking to myself, if our tongue is a fire, and by the way, if you got a, a fire in your mouth, why do you need hot sauce? I, I don't understand. You know, it just seems like we got enough in there. We don't need any more. So, yeah. So I was thinking, if the tongue is a fire, what, what does that mean? It means that actually the, our tongues are the fire, but our lives and the lives of those around us are the forest. So it's a restless evil, the, the scripture says, and full of poison. Thing is, is words just don't stand by themselves, right? I mean, we don't just say things without thinking. Well, we do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> but we don't say things without having a reason for saying them. And so what we have to think about when we're thinking about words and in manipulation is why? Why are we saying what we're saying? So because what happens is words come from our motivations, and we don't often recognize what our motivations are, but words lead to actions. So it's important for us to understand what's going on inside of us. It's important to know what our motivations are. And you can kind of know in your own life and the lives of others what is going on in a person's life by what comes out of their mouth. You say to yourself, I wonder if, I got, if I've got a, a handle on that problem. Well, listen to what you talk about. You'll find out whether you've got a handle on your problems, okay? Let's get a definition up for manipulation. This is kind of harsh, but this is really what it is. A skillful handling, controlling, or influence over another. Exerting shrewd or devious influence, especially for one's own advantage. Now, let's pick, uh, pick that apart a little bit. Uh, I, I use, there's a phrase I use all the time. Uh, I'm going to have to handle that person. And that's exactly what it means. When I say that, that's kind of what I mean is, is what we're doing is we're, when we manipulate, it's about control, not about service. Okay? So you can kind of, and we'll learn this later on in the story. We're going through a story in the Bible that I just love. I, I, I love it because it's Bible uh, reality TV. <laughs> so everybody should love it, right? So... What it is about, about this is you're, um, and this is what we have done our whole lives. We don't recognize, we see it in our children. As children, what they'll do is children will um, convince their friend to do their homework, right? Oh, I think it's done. Can you do it for me? And they offer some kind of prize for that. You uh, also will um, get your siblings to not tattle on that. Now, <laughs> did you know that the most powerful words that a child can say is, I'm telling them. 
Yeah. Right? Oh, it strikes fear into the heart of people. <laughs> Kids especially. Okay? So let me give you a story how that works. My brother, now my older brother Mike, uh, we used to get on the backside of our garage near the, we had alleys in Tacoma back then. And we're not supposed to be up there. You know, Dad would offer the belt to us if he caught us. So we would sit up there and, I don't know, whatever kids do. And so Mike gets up one day. We're sitting up there. He says, hey, i got to go to the bathroom. I'm right back. So I'm sitting in the back on the roof in the back so the house is on the other side. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. He never comes back. So I'm like, Dah. So I come up and I walk up and I get over the peak of the roof. And there's my brother with a Kodak or with a, one of those Kodak instant cameras. Click. And I'm like, oh. Well, I thought about it, and years later, I thought, what was he thinking? He's on the roof taking the picture, so he's going to be in trouble too, right? But I bribed him with candy or whatever, and it didn't matter. He had a, I don't know, somebody found the picture or whatever, and we both got in trouble. <laughs> Terrible. But I bribed him for everything I was worth to not get caught, right? Another thing that happens, and you'll see this in, in kids that are young, they'll say, Mommy, I love you so much. Can I have a treat? <laughs> right? When we get older, it kind, of, it kind of looks like this. A guy talking to his girlfriend. Honey, you are the apple of my eye. Your face is like a dove's. I, I just love you. I couldn't live without you. By the way, my daughter would kill you if you said stuff like that. She's like, da. Right? But so we profess, it's usually guys that do this. Oh, I just love you so much. Well, they're trying to get another kind of treat, right? It's all manipulation, right? Sorry, I didn't say anything bad. It's all in your minds. <laughs> so, <laughs> watch out. You know, we, we foster as adults. As adults, we foster relationships, and we don't recognize we do this, but you can see it in others, and we often do it ourselves. We foster relationships um, for reasons, our own reasons, and that is things like, uh, you know a guy that's rich, and he's got a nice boat, and you love to fish, so you want to be his friend. Why? You, you know a, a woman who has you know, a salon that she can do your nails or whatever, and you want to be her friend? Why? Okay. It's, it's important. I had a guy by the name of Jeff. This is a great name, Jeff Criddlebaugh. And he, he owned a um, Beto's RV. And now we did use an RV once, right? But people, I swear to you, you, you could watch people go into this place and the, and the gymnastics they would go through to be his friend. The things they would say, the things they would try to do for him, the things they would promise so that they could use what he offered. Now he was a in his defense, he was a really, um, a guy that was really, uh, really wanted to give, give away. And so that was his love language or the way he got friends, whatever it was. But people manipulated him constantly to get what he had to offer. So that's how I would do that. I guess what you might say is that the epitome of manipulation is, is uh, seen in our, what we, who we call the father of lies. Satan, that's what he does to all of us. That's right. See, and... A good example of that is uh, at when Jesus got done being baptized and went into the wilderness, Satan was there, and he was there to tempt him. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about this is he waited, obviously, till there was 40 days gone by. Jesus is hungry, thirsty, just exhausted. Now, Jesus was a man, right? He was God, but he was a man. So he waits till then, and then he says, you're the son of God. Why don't you make these stones bread? So, and then later on, he says, there's three, but I'm going to skip to the third one. He says, look at the kingdoms of the earth. And I believe that meant the kingdoms that were then the, the giant empires and the ones that would come like us. And he says, I will give you all of these. Because at that time, Jesus, not Jesus, Satan had authority over that. He could give those, the authority over those. What he was trying to do was change the course of history by changing Manipulating Jesus to change his motivation for what he was doing. Give him a shortcut. Don't go through the death. I'll give it to you if you bow down. The ex these two examples help us see that a lot of times, in fact, if you look at yourself most of the times, we are using other people's weaknesses in order to gain advantage. Manipulation is really a little worm, right? I mean, we don't realize how insidious it is until we 
start taking stock of what we're doing. Okay, we're going to um, go to Genesis 25. We can go to that. Genesis 25, 27. We're going to be talking about a family that we all know. In fact, it was the family that started the 12 tribes of Israel. It was Isaac and Rebekah's family, and they had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Now, Rebekah had had a hard time conceiving, so God told her, you're going to have two sons. And she said, those two sons in your womb are going to be at war from the beginning. And they are going to have a rivalry between each other. And so this is what happens. She finds up that she had, that she has two, uh, two kids. And here's the interesting thing. And I don't want you to do this because we're going to see why it's bad. In Genesis 25, it says, as the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. All men say, woo, woo, hunter! hunter! He, was, he was an outdoorsman. I knew a guy like this that never was home, but uh, it cost him. Jacob had a, great, had a quiet temperament, and he preferred to stay home. Isaac loved Esau because he loved, he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebecca loved Jacob. What well, we see is favoritism here. So in the family, listen, this is like I said, this is, this is like reality TV for Christians. This stuff happens all the time, right? Well, God, what's good about the Word of God, and I love the Old Testament. I love the New Testament, too, but the Old Testament has stories that should be putting into movies. <laughs> anyway, they had favorites, and they had favorites for specific reasons. Now, one of the things I, I want us to understand is that Esau's name is, means red, and why does it mean that? Because when he came out, he had, he's one of those guys who got hair on his back, right? He comes out full of red hair, right? I just want to clear something up right now, and that is that just because you're a ginger doesn't mean you're bad, all right? How many times, how many times have you seen on TV or a movie, it's the little Eddie Haskell, or it's the, it's the little redheaded kid that's like, oh, yeah. You know, it's the kid that's causing the troubles. Always a ginger. It's not true, okay? I was a ginger. It was probably true about me, but it's not true about other people, okay? <laughs> Jacob, his, his um, name means to, uh, he who grasps the heel. Now, you can imagine, most of the time people say, well, I'm the firstborn. I'm, I'm the firstborn by four minutes. Okay, you know, my, my wife is a twin, and she'll say something to that. She was last, though. She was Jacob. Hey. Sorry. <laughs> what happened is when the boys came out... Um, Jacob had a hold of Esau's heel. That's why they named him that. Real, real innovative, right? When they come up with names. So what it was is these two boys were really different. Couldn't be any more different. Uh, Esau, like we heard, is an outdoorsman. He wants to be outside all the time. Doesn't want to stay inside. Wants to hunt. Wants to fish. He would be like, uh, nowadays they'd put him on Survivor Man. Or they'd put him on uh, uh, Bear Grylls or something like that, right? Well, Jacob was just the opposite. And I think that's why his mom loved him. He wanted to be inside. He was a mama's boy. He would probably be the favored son. They'd be, he's such a good boy. You know? The thing is, is they were so different. I mean, Jacob would have been like, uh, he would have fit right in on the cooking channel. Would be great for him, right? <laughs> thing is, is a lot of times what happens in situations like this, you got a guy like Esau who's very demonstrative in the things that are wrong with him. And so he's looked at as like a problem child. Why? One of the things he did when he was older is he married two Midianite women. Now, as far as it happened from Abraham on, you didn't marry outside of the Jewish people. You married your cousin and your second cousin. By the way, it was okay back then. And that's what you did. And why did they do that? Because they knew if you, if you married outside of the Jewish uh, family or your family, you were likely to have those Spouses uh, lead you into leading into uh, uh, worshiping idols, worshiping other gods. So it, you didn't do it. Well, Esau didn't really care. You know, Esau wants. To, he was like a guy that was a guy just being a guy, right? <laughs> That's Esau, <laughs> right? So he, should, he was kind of careless, and he lacked respect for for tradition. And he, he just didn't really care. He was kind of like I was when I was a kid. You just I'm going to do what I want to do, and if you don't like it, I'll. I guess you have a problem. <laughs> Jacob looked like the better guy. The problem with Jacob is he was sneaky, shrewd. He, would, he looked like he was good, and he wasn't. He's like my brother, Steve. Be careful, be careful. Oh, Steve's a better guy than me, but he was, yeah. <laughs> let's, go to, um, let's go to Genesis 25, 29 through 34. 
One day, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Hmm. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Pretty crazy, huh? Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. He just, he just lets, I mean, the firstborn rights were huge. I mean, it included not only a double portion of the inheritance, but it included the right to be the leader and the priest of the whole family. I mean, he didn't care. And I think maybe he didn't care because of those last two things. He wanted to be outside. He wanted, I'm just it's conjecture, but he wanted to be outside. He wanted to be doing, he wanted to be in there signing papers behind the CEO desk. He wanted to be outside. So he was like, I don't really care. And it shows him that he just left. Didn't even think twice about it. Jacob got what he wanted. And he did it when? During a moment of weakness. He used the weakness of his brother to, do, to get what he wanted. Now, you can kind of tell in this, in this thing that this might have been something that they had argued over before because the exasperation that Esau shows is just like, oh, we're we talking about this again. So this is probably an ongoing rivalry, something, because what had happened before, when, before they were born, is their mother had been told that the younger would serve the older. And so Rebecca's kind of like, yeah, I'm going to make sure that happens. Why? Her son, Jacob, is her favorite. So this whole thing, all these things going on in this family, kind of shows there was manipulation going on everybody's part, except maybe Isaac. He was just kind of there. <laughs> so, What happened here is, so what happens is, this, this goes on, you go on, go on later, and, and Isaac gets old, and he thinks he's older than he actually is. He thinks he's going to die, so he gets a hold of his son Esau, his favorite, says, go out in the field, get me something good to eat, cook it up, and when you come back, I'll eat it, and I'll bless you. Now, this blessing is a huge thing. It's not just like, bless you. It is, <laughs> it is a, again, remember, the, it's like a double portion, but this is monetary. This is land. This is animals. This is servants. This is all your brothers serving you. This is a big deal, and you only get one blessing. There's only one blessing in the family. So he goes out, he's going to go, he's been doing this for years, he knows, he knows what his dad likes. Rebecca hears it, and her thing is like, oh, this isn't going to work out good. So what she do? She tells her son, she kind of gets him in, a, so it's really the start of her manipulating, and she says, go out and get two kids, which is goats, and I she's got to be a good cook, because she can make that taste like wild game. <laughs> so she says... She says, this is what I want you to do. You're going to go before your father. You're going to tell him you're Esau, and he's going to bless you. And he's like, Whoa, wait a minute. My brother's hairy, and I'm not. My brother smells like the outdoors. I don't. If my father figures out this is what I'm doing, he will curse me instead of bless me. And she says, may that curse fall on me. She is so desperate to get what she wants, to, and she's manipulating her own husband against her own other son. This is terrible. So she cooks it up. She puts fur on his arms and his hands from the goats she, she just cooked up. She puts it on his neck, and she sends him in. And uh, uh, Isaac says, who is it? And he's like, it's, it's me, Esau. Well, you know, the guy's got to know his voice, right? So Isaac's like, you don't sound like Esau. You, you sound like Jacob. He says, come here. So he comes there, and, and he you know, puts his hand on his neck, feels he's hairy, puts his hands on his arm, and he goes... You don't, I don't, are you sure you're my son? So here is Jacob having to lie over and over because of, his, at first, his mother's manipulation and now his. Now it's his manipulation. Now he's probably saying, if I don't pull this off, I'm a dead man. So what happens is he leans close and his father smells the clothes that Rebecca put on Jacob because it smells like Esau. She thought this thing out. So, she blessed, uh, so Isaac eats food, blesses him, and sends him out. You know, two seconds later, in comes Esau. And Esau, and I thought about this this week. I, I just could not get this, um, I just couldn't get this out of my mind. Esau comes in, and it says that Isaac 
trembled uncontrollably. He was like, what? What happened? Firstborn is the one that gets the blessing. That's always the way it is. So now it's found out that Jacob has, and well, and the mom, have made it to where they have done something that should not be done in Israel. Firstborn does not get the birthright, nor does he get the blessing. What I couldn't get away from is how, how Esau responded. Because, you know, we saw before, he don't care about his birthright. He just wants to do what he wants to do. He's a man that's a man. He's, that's a guy that's a guy that's being a guy. He don't care. So we kind of go, whatever, you get what you deserve. This isn't how it works out. We look at Genesis uh, 27, 34, and 38. When Esau heard this, they figured out what went on. And Esau heard this, his father's words. And his father told him, you'll get nothing. You'll, you'll be away from the fat of the land. You'll have to live by, you know, by your weapons. Um, you get nothing. And Esau says... He let out a loud and bitter cry. Oh, my father, what about me? Bless me too, he begged. And it goes on. His father tells him what he's missed, what he's not going to get. And he says, Esau pleaded, but do you have only one blessing, oh, my father? Bless me too. Then Esau broke down and wept. Now, you look at Esau, and what happens with manipulators is they don't really see what happens to the people they manipulate. They don't see this. Now, a lot of times manipulators will say, well, you, you kind of got what you deserved. You, you're kind of stupid. <laughs> I pull the wool over your eyes, literally. And um, he never knew what his brother felt like. And some people might think, well, he kind of deserved that. Well, when his brother figured this out, he said, I'm going to kill him. Now, you can imagine, these guys are twins, right? It's supposed to be some regular thing, but they've been in, they've been in uh, rivalry with each other forever. So, he, he determines he is going to kill his brother after his dad dies. So, the problem with it is, is that uh, Isaac didn't understand. <laughs> He's not as dead as he thought he was. It's 43 more years before he dies. Rebecca, again, here's what's going on. Doesn't want to lose both her sons because one gets killed. One's going to have to run off and somebody's going to attack them. So, she makes the excuse, hey, let's send Jacob to go get a... Uh, go get a wife. Doing the right thing. Don't get a Midianite wife. Go get a wife from my cousin. Well, she sends him under the guise of that to get him away from Esau so he didn't kill him. Sends him to a guy named Laban. Now, we've heard about Laban before <laughs> when it came to Isaac. This guy, he, you talk about a manipulator. His whole family's like, this guy has been looking after Isaac's money for as long as he can think. He knows that Isaac has money, and he wants some of it. So they send him to Laban. Now, this is where we say, what's the word I wrote down here? This is where we say, what goes around comes around. <laughs> Remember, we said at the beginning, you know, how to get what you want and then get what you deserve. This is where it happens. And this is what happens to manip and manipulators. And I say manipulators, it sounds like some guy with a cloak on that's running around. It's all of us, guys. It's all of us. We do this in little ways. He goes to Laban. Laban is a, ah, he's bad. Long story short, he falls in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. Rachel? Yeah. And um, Laban says, hey, you got to work for her. Why is that? Because you had to have a dowry to have a wife. And if you didn't have anything, which uh, Jacob wasn't sent away with anything, then you had to work for five to seven years for the father so that you could have the wife. That's what he did. And it says that he loved her so much that it, it seemed like a week. So it comes to the wedding day. Guys, I don't know how this happens because this is so strange to me. How do you marry somebody else than the one you love? I have no idea. Must have been a lot of veils. I don't know. So they get married and they consummate the marriage that night. It's a seven-day feast, but they consummate the marriage, which means he sleeps with her. I don't know how you do that and not know who the woman is either, but uh, <laughs> Jacob was pretty dumb. When he wakes up in the morning, it's not Rachel. It's Leah. Leah. He goes in rage to his uncle, who's Laban, and says, hey, what'd you do? Laban says, hey, what are you looking at me for? You know what the customs are. We don't marry off the second person, the second daughter before the first. But I tell you what, you work for me seven more years, you see how it works out. So what happens is they wait the seven weeks before... Um, uh, of the marriage thing for him and Leah, and then he just gives him Rachel. So he has two wives now within a week, and he's got seven more years of work. He's a, he's a shepherd. <sighs> 
you know, you kind of get what you, what you give, right? So what happens now is he loses track of his family. He never sees his mother again. He never sees his father again. His brother is waiting to find him and kill him. And now he's got two women in the house that are sisters, that are rivals, and they got to have babies. They just want babies. That's all they want, right? So <laughs> this is how the tribes of Judah came to be, right? It's terrible. I can't even imagine. You have them bribing. Hey, if you'll sleep with me tonight, I'll give pomegranates to your slaves. I mean, it's just, it's crazy, right? All right. I was telling you. So he kind of got what he deserved. So I, I kind of look at uh, manipulating like, um, like a disease, so we're going to look at the symptoms of, of manipulators. How can you tell if you're doing it or someone else you know is fallen into this trap? First, um, what, the motivation is why do I do what I do? Wh I mean, what's my motivation? Why? It's always why, right? First one is do you find yourself or others using anger for control? This happens in a bunch of different ways. Um, well, I'll just speak for myself. I'm a guy that loves to learn stuff, and my wife will tell you I have a, a head full of useless information. I'm not sure that's always true, but it's partly true. So what, when we first got married, I mean, I did all kinds of study and stuff, and I would, my wife's not dumb. She's smart, but I, I'm one of those people that would say, you know, we start with an argument or a conversation, and I would back you into the corner by saying, well, what about this? And I don't know that it was always malicious. It was like, well, I don't understand. What, what, how can you think that when this is true? And I can think what it ended up doing was ex exerting a control over her that was damaging for her. And I was an anger guy when I was younger. And that anger did a number of things. People will use anger for control. And both men and women do this, but men do this a lot. And they do it to hide what they don't want somebody else to know. It's like uh, the wife says, uh, what's, this, uh, what's this lingerie thing in the checkbook, honey? The guy blows up and changes the subject, and she never gets a question answered. Women will do the same thing in different ways, but anger for control. Do you find yourself isolating through the anger and controlling other people, keeping them from finding out? Here's, here's a good one, nagging. Now, nagging, is, it's hard to kind of, I thought of this, I couldn't quite figure out how it worked. Nagging is for security. If a person is nagging you, in other words, they keep talking over and over and over about the same thing, it, it really comes from worry and fear. They want something to get done, they want you to do it, and you're not doing it fast enough. So they nag and nag, and they orchestrate things so that you get it done because of their own fear. Is that something that we end up doing? Knowledge to gain superiority. This kind of goes along with what I was saying about myself. Uh, people, some people have knowledge for knowledge's sake. And I, <laughs> I had a, a, a counselor. I should have had more counselors when I was young. <laughs> Nobody caught me, I guess. Um, he used to tell me when I would talk to him, he'd say, Pat, you know a lot of stuff. You know what's right. I think you just come in here to talk about your problems and make yourself feel better. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find out a little bit later what that means and how that works with us. So um, there's a song I love. And there's a thing called, uh, we go next to flattery. And flattery is, <laughs> flattery is just a shade off from the right thing. So is it wrong to encourage somebody? No. We're supposed to be doing that, right? The Bible says it all over. Encourage people. What's the difference between Encouragement and flattery. How do you know? How do you know if you're doing that? You're right. It's motive. Why are you saying it? Are you saying something to a woman that's uh, because you want her attention to make yourself feel better? Are you saying something um, to your uh, teacher at school so he give you a better grade? Are you saying things to your friends in order to get them to respond a certain way or to do a certain thing? So the difference between flattery... And encouraging somebody is motivation. Why? Again, we're back to why are we doing what we're doing? Do we think about it? Do we actually ask ourselves, why did I say that? Okay, 
there's, <laughs> there's a song I love by a guy by the name of Brian Duncan. And in one of his songs, he says, a perfect motive has another ulterior. Check yours twice when you feel superior. When you think you're right, why don't you check to see if you're doing things for the right reason, right? Um, okay, here's one that, uh, you know, we're talking about words, right? But here's one that is, you would seem to think is the uh, opposite of words. And everybody does it. This is, the, this is the cold war of marriage, right? The silent treatment. So you could use words, or you could not use words and get the same result. This happens in marriages. It's happened in our marriage. It's, what it is is people don't know how to communicate or they don't want to. Or they're, or they're going to make you pay. So you don't say something for a day or a two or a three or a month or a year or ten years. And it becomes this powerful thing. It's a manipulation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you a lesson. I'm going to show you that you hurt me. Whatever it is. But the silent treatment is, um, is really punishment. We use it to punish people. Or we use it if we're accused of something and it makes us angry. It goes back to the anger thing. And then we use it because we will not drop our pride and just admit or talk about what we want. We won't work it out. It's silent treatment. It's just as bad as saying something, sometimes worse. Who, does, who, who do these things affect? Obviously, they affect the people that we manipulate. And one of the things I was thinking about this last week is um, we don't see the whole picture. We just don't see a little picture of what our actions cause. So let's say that I want somebody to uh, stay because uh, they're my friend and I just love them and I, and I want them to stay. And so I hound them and whether it be with, uh, you know, uh, worry or whatever, I hound them to stay. God wanted them maybe to go to Arizona and do a ministry, but there's something about what I want that I pick away at them and manipulate and cause them to change their plans. What about God's plans? What, am I going to be the person that causes someone else to not do what God wants them to do? That's a, that's a big thing, guys. I mean, we don't see that because usually we're looking at nothing but ourselves. Another thing is, um, and this, this is a little obscure, but you have people in your lives that just need help. And you have relatives in your lives that just need help. And what we do sometimes is we rescue people. Yeah. Why? Because of our fear. I don't want that to happen to my kid. I don't want that to happen to my friend. And so we bail them out over and over. And, we, and it's our fear that's doing it. So we manipulate the situation when actually maybe God wanted them to go through those consequences right. instead of us bailing them out. Yeah. So there's a lot of little insidious ways to do this. The innocent. Again, remember we said we don't... Um, we don't really see what our words do. We don't really see what it is, the effects down the road. And we don't see the, uh, what you might call the um, collateral damage of what we do. You know, people have spheres of influence, right? I mean, you guys know people. You guys know people. Everybody knows somebody that the other people don't know. Look at Facebook, right? And what we say or do or cause a person to not do or do changes everybody else around them. We don't see it. All we are looking at is what we want. But it changes everybody else's reality. Not a good thing. The innocent get caught in the crossfire. All right, our loved ones. Now, here's a bad one, guys. This goes back to the silent treatment. So I asked my son. I, uh, we, I was a class that uh, I'm involved in called Pure Desire. And one of the things we learned there is, is there's a lot of things we learned there. One of the things we learned there is the damage that happens in families that is unseen. I asked my son, I said, so, this is one of the things we had, to, we had to talk about in the class. I said, so, what things, when you were growing up in our family, really put you on edge or really made you nervous? And he gave me an answer that I never would have thought of. He said, when it was silent between you and mom. I could tell when you guys were mad because there was no words. We're not yellers, you know. We just, you know, I don't have any dogs to kick anymore. I don't live in the country, so I just got to stuff it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so anyway, so look at this. We say in, in our, well, it could be actions or it could be, um, it could be silences. What we're saying is, I'll teach you. You're going to pay. I'm going to teach you. And who are we teaching? No, that person's, they don't care. We're teaching our kids. 
We're teaching our friends, oh, that's how you do it. We're damaging people without even knowing it. All right, the last one is ourselves. And I just got one statement for this, and that is getting what you want shall not sacrifice who you are. And we don't see the end from the beginning. We just don't. And so we, we make decisions and we do things like this and realize later, I shouldn't have done that. That changed everything for me. We damage ourselves. What's an antidote? What are the antidotes for, manip- for manipulation? If it's a disease, not a disease, a sickness, I think it's sin. But if, it's, if we're treating it like a disease, how do, we, how do we get out of it? How do we keep from hurting other people? How do we keep from hurting ourselves? Well, the very first thing we should do is ask God to reveal our motivations and what we say and what we do. We've been talking about that a lot, right? Motivations are important. We have to know why we do what we do. Let's turn to uh, Jeremiah 17, 9. It's a great verse. It says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Do we even know? I, mean, I tell you what, I spent a lot of years and a lot of sin And it took me years to look back and go, wow, I was that guy? We don't see it when we're doing it. Uh, I was going through this, and I read in in, uh, Lang's uh, commentary uh, something that just hit me in the face. Let's see if I can explain this, because it's a little obscure. It says, but there is nothing in the world so deceitful as the human heart, which understands the art thoroughly of pursuing the evil under the appearance of wishing the right. That just kind of goes to show you what the heart is like. We'll say, to, well, here's an example. I'll, I'll bring it to my example. I'll say, I really want to lose weight. I do. I just, I just feel tired all the time. I'm this, I'm that. I really want to get this under control. Well, that's what everyone's like, man, he's really trying. Did I actually do anything about it? Did I stop eating that hamburger? Did I stop getting up at 3 in the morning going, hmm, in front of the fridge, you know, letting all the cold air out? <laughs> no. Really what it is, is is if your actions are not matching your words, what are you doing? You're fooling yourself. And you're fooling other people. You're saying, I'm a good guy. I, I, I know I have this problem, but I'm working on it. Mm. Meanwhile, you're pursuing the very thing that you say you hate. It's what your heart does. It's not a good thing. It's a self-deception. All right. Next one would be purpose to think of others' needs before yours. Uh, Philippians 2, 3 and 4, am I right? Yeah. yeah. Says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Next. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Uh, who was it? Joyce Myers, heard her say something one day that I thought was interesting. She said, the most miserable people on the earth are people who think only of themselves. And the only way to happiness is to think of others first always. The only way to happiness and love and all the things we're looking for is to stop thinking about ourselves. So purpose to think of other people, actively say, oh, I want this, but what does that person need? It's hard to do, guys, because all of us want what we want, and we want it now, right? Here's another thing that the Pure Desire Group has, has taught me and others. Be aware. Amen. Be aware in every moment. Here's the thing. You go through life, I don't know, like, probably like me, you go through life, and, and things happen during the day, and you're just kind of floating along and thinking for the weekend, and don't really think about what's going on, and you don't realize what is passing through your life. We don't examine ourselves. We don't look at our motives. I would say you want to live on purpose, not on autopilot. The problem with what happens here is we are not doing what the Scripture says. And the Scripture says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Well, what does that mean? You know, I, I, did I get him? No. <laughs> what it means is, are we aware of what we're thinking? Do we, even, do we even think about what we're thinking? When you go through the day and somebody says something and you get that little, I don't know about, guys are probably like this. You get that little, that little scenario in your head about how you're going to get in a fist fight and you're going to just clean this guy's clock. And it's just in your head. But you don't even think about it. 
You don't think about what you're thinking about, what is rolling through your head, so you never stop what you're thinking. Be aware. It's an important thing. Be aware of what's going on in your head. Because if you're not, whatever is rolling through your head, remember, thoughts and motivations lead to words, lead to actions. If you are not aware of what's going on in your life, you will never control your life. Don't be a bully. Don't be a bully. Well, here, here's the thing. What, what is a bully? A bully always does what he wants when he wants it, and he makes you do it for him. God is not like that. God has the power to do anything he wants. God has the right to do anything he wants. But, is, but does he? There's a thing called the goodness of God we'll talk about in just a second before we close. God has the right to do anything, but what he does is what's good for us. I mean, here's God. He, he's right no matter what he does, but he doesn't serve himself. We all know, right? He sent Jesus on the cross. Do you realize that every single day the Holy Spirit is working in your life? Every single day he's thinking of you and doing for you. Why? That's who God is. He's not a bully. I wrote down, God is not a bully. He tells us the truth. And then he lets us make our own decision. He could force us. That's not love. God's not a bully, so we shouldn't be. The problem is, is if God were a bully, we would have no free will. True. Manipulation steals another's free will. True. So we don't want to be doing that. If God doesn't do it, we don't want to do it. All right. And true love does not use coercion. If you've got to force somebody to do something, that's why Jesus... But that's why God came down and did what he did. He wanted not robots. He wanted people who loved him. You can't use coercion if you want love. Okay, it's not just other people that get manipulated by us. All That's what we want to worry about mostly. It's us being manipulated. How do you keep that from happening? How do you, how do you stop this, this eddy, this sea of stuff going around? What happens a lot of times is Christians don't think. I know that's a blanket statement. But compared to years and decades past, we don't think like we used to think. We don't pay attention to what's going through our mind, like I was saying. How do you keep from being manipulated? Be sober-minded. Say it all over in the scripture. You see it all through the New Testament. Be sober-minded. What's the one you remember? Be sober-minded because the devil is like a lion, seeking who he, roaring, seeking who he can devour. Well, how does that happen? If, if you understand a little bit about, little bit about lions, they, the male stands up and roars like a madman, and everybody runs from him, and, and it runs to the females who does the kill. So we have to pay attention. We have to, and, what, and when it comes to being sober-minded, we got to know the truth of who we are. Okay? If you don't know the truth, if you don't, people will say, I'm going to read the Book of Mormon so I know how, how the Mormon people think so I won't fall into in the error. No. You know the truth. And everything that's not the truth is real evident. So know the truth. If we don't want to be manipulated by other people or by ourselves, we need to know the truth. We know the truth about who we are in Christ. And we have to think rightly. We've got to be thinking Christians. We can't just go through not paying attention to what's in our head. We can't go through not knowing what the scripture says. We can't go through life not thinking about issues in the, in the way and in the mind of Christ. We have to think or we'll be taken advantage of. In the, in the end, the scripture says if it were not for the Holy Spirit and the end day is that even the elect would be deceived. I mean, we need to know what we're doing. All right, almost done, guys. Still okay? <laughs> This is the crux of the whole thing. If you don't remember anything, remember this. God is good. What does that mean? Does that mean he's just this good stuff? Everybody says a lot about God's grace. God is so gracious. He gave his grace. He pulled me out of the pit. All that stuff's true. But you know that his grace is predicated upon his goodness. God is good. And so God is good, so he gives us grace. What is good? It means with God, not that he just does good things but that he is goodness. Our problem when it comes to manipulation are two things. We don't examine ourselves and we will not wait on God. Good. Rachel, well, not Rachel, I always said, Rebecca, my, my son's got to get the, got to get what he's supposed to get. What she do? She ain't going to wait on God. God. God already said it was going to happen. She wouldn't wait. We will not wait on God and so we force 
the hand of others to get what we want. That's a dangerous thing because God has a will for your life and my life. He has a certain thing he wants to have done. And don't get in the way because I don't know about you, but in my life, I've gotten in the way a lot. And I look back and go, you know, if I hadn't have done that or been with these people, or if I had, things would have been drastically different. I didn't wait. I didn't trust God. That's really what it is. God is good. We all say, God is good. Oh, God is good. But we don't trust him. And what does that mean? God's like, if anyone can be trusted, it's him. And I think the whole cosmic experience is the fact that the angels who knew him, the angels who fell, who stood before his face, began to not understand his goodness, began to not believe that. And they did what they wanted for themselves. It's no different with us. If you want to have a good life, if you want to be in the center of God's will, you better wait for him. Oh, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me too. It's just terrible. We will not wait on God. We must wait on God. And he often tests us so to see if we will wait to give us the best. All right. God's goodness in my life is, exa- is exhibited by my wife. Um, I got to tell you, um, I would not be here. I would not be anywhere. I, I was pulled out of the fire when I was really young by the power of God around Satanist people and people I was hanging around. And I was pulled out by well, the goodness of God with some people who put up with me. I was a dangerous person. They... They let that be, and they gave me grace. When I married my wife, she didn't know what she was getting. Uh, I didn't know what she was getting. There is goodness all around you. God is good all the time in your life. We don't pay attention. We don't look. We need to look and recognize and praise God for the every day there's things that he's good, good for us. I wrote this statement. What this boils down to is when we manipulate, we choose to view view God's will as an option. We try to exert our will over God's because our desires and goals are more important to us than his. Check your motivations. Let God work out his plan. And then, of course, you're going to laugh at me for this, but I just had to say this because it wouldn't get out of my head. If you don't remember anything else, remember, God is good. You can trust him. Check your motivations. And if you want to remember it in one statement, check yourself before you wreck yourself. (laughs) Right? We all know that one, right? (laughs) Listen, if we do this stuff, if we pay attention to what's in our minds, if we ask ourselves all the time, examine ourselves, why am I doing this? And let God tell you, the Holy Spirit, listen, if you don't do this, you're not going to hear the Holy Spirit. Uh, In the last three, four years, I, I... I can tell. I'll get something in my head. I'll go, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. That's what he'd say. It's like, (laughs) you know. (laughs) But the more that we listen, the more that we examine ourselves, the more we will hear and the straighter our path will be. More peace in our relationships if we do this. More peace in our hearts. And because of what we do and do not do, more peace in the world. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for, for being a God that included us. I want to thank you that uh, you didn't leave us to ourselves and that, Holy Spirit, that you don't leave us to ourselves. Every day you, you cry out to us and whisper to us uh, the wisdom of what we should be and what we should do, not because it's what you want for yourself, but it's what you want for us. Thank you for being a good God that can be trusted at all times and that we need to believe you because you are worthy to be believed. Thank you for these people. Bless them. Bless your word, Lord, um, and, the, and the going of it. Help us have hearing ears and hearts that are, that are willing to uh, obey. In Jesus' name, amen.